Welcome to Pandemic Podcast for Educators. My name's Gawain. I'm Cara. And I'm Merica. Today we're going to be talking about the update to Development Matters, what that means for those working in early years settings. And we're really, really pleased to have two special guests with us. We've got Elaine Bennett. Hi, I'm Elaine. I'm an early years teacher down in Essex. And Lucy Coleman. Hi, uh, I'm Lucy. I'm from Oxfordshire. I've been an early years teacher for many years and I've just moved into Key Stage 1. So um, this is very, very new, isn't it? This update to Development Matters has just come out. What, what's been the process behind it? Uh, where does it come from? Elaine, do you want to? Yeah, um, well, interestingly, this hasn't actually come from the sector particularly. Um, you might be aware there's also been a uh, rewrite of the EYFS which is the statutory framework and development matters obviously is a non-statutory element of guidance and it all really came from a primary um, assessment consultation a few years ago which actually didn't have much representation from early years um, sector so that is really what kicked it off kicked off the process of the rewrite um, and I do say it's a rewrite so the rewrite of the EYFS and now the rewrite of the um, guidance that we're talking about today. Right, so this is not just an update, but a rewrite of two key documents yeah. for the early years. Um, Definitely with, a rewrite and not an update. They are so different. But with very little early years involvement in the rewrite, it seems a little counterintuitive, doesn't it? Why, why would they bother consulting those who actually work in that sector? Uh, right, okay. So interesting start to it. And, uh, uh, so there's what what level of consultation has there been Lucy? Uh, well very little um, and the early years sector have you know responded to the original uh, guidance to the early learning goals but none of that response has been listened to by the government there was um, a, a consultation but very little of the evidence from the consultation has gone into this um, update yeah largely been ignored i think i think the frustration is obviously with the eyfs as a statutory framework that there had to be a consultation for that so that consultation i mean they had so many responses to it the dfe including being handed like a document of evidence so that was com basically completely ignored so the eyfs reforms haven't been very well received but this guidance now because it's non-statutory guidance matters, there hasn't got to be a consultation because it's not statutory guidance. Mm -hmm. so, right, okay, so you've got the statutory bit had a, had yeah. a consultation involved in it, although the mm -hmm. extent to which that's been listened to is maybe yeah. open to question. But then this bit they can just produce without, without mm -hmm. needing a full consultation of any sort. Yeah. Okay, okay. You're lo all looking really thrilled by that, that process. <laughs> <laughs> so I can imagine as a sector what that what that feels like. So so give me a kind of what what's the shape of it? How is it structured? Is it similar to the previous guidance, or is it America? You're shaking no. your head. Yeah. So in the the previous guidance um, was split into I think it was in total seventeen curriculum areas because your main curriculum areas were then broken down into little subsections. That's no longer the case. So for example, in the last version of it in what was it communication and that section there was speaking understanding and listening and attention those three subsections no longer exist it's all lumped in as one thing same with writing um same with sorry literacy used to be broken down into reading and writing now it's just literacy Maths used to be number and shapes based on measure. Now it's just maths. Um, so that's making it a little bit tricky to try and unpick various things because some children were like really good at number and not so great with the, the shape. And you could use that quite easily to, to pick out the, the gaps that they had and help them improve through your continuous provision in your classroom and learning through play. So that's an issue. Not only that, the previous guidance was broken down into months, so age bands. 
so that you could see what age range the children were working at. So we had things like 30 to 50 months was your usual one for nursery, 40 to 60 um, was your next one, and then your early learning goals. Obviously, there's bands before that because yeah. this document goes from birth. Um, so that gives you an, an idea that children can move along at different paces. Yeah. But Absolutely. Stage not age, we always got told. Stage not age. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that's no longer the case. There are three sections now. There's birth to three because so much can, you know, how, how can you have so all of the stuff that happens between birth and a three-year-old being lumped into one section? It boggles my mind, but never mind. That's now one section. Then you've got three and four-year-olds, or as it actually says, three and four-year-olds will be learning to. And then children in reception will be learning to. Uh, I don't know about you, Lucy, Andy Lynn, but I'm not a fan of that. Um, I think it's actually putting a cap on learning, whether it's intentional or not. So I teach nursery. And from looking at that document, the immediate thing that springs to mind is, oh, OK, so if I've got a child who's already hitting all of the things that a three and four year old should be doing, am I not allowed to dip into the next section because they're not in reception? And the, the guidance is saying to me, children in reception will be learning to, but that child's not in reception. And on a flip side, if there is a child in reception who isn't quite at those goals yet and still needs to be working at a band that's slightly lower down are they not allowed to do that because they're in reception and they need to be learning the things that it says so i think the way that they phrased it isn't particularly sensitive at all i don't but like more, that more, more kind of prescriptive in terms of age oh, bands. i mean yeah. what's, yeah. what's the impact of that well i i mean so like america said before the age bands there was crossover so you'd have 30 to 50 40 to 60 so a four-year-old could be in either of those bands, depending on their development. And, I, and also for me, I used to work in a private nursery with um, babies and ones to twos. And, you know, lumping birth to three, like Merica said, all in one section. I mean, the, the old birth to three guidance that I was using when I was a nursery nurse was so detailed and had those tiny little steps, which are really important as a practitioner to look out for. And if a child isn't hitting those miles, milestones, particularly, you know, at age two, then there could be a deeper issue that, you know, as a practitioner, you would be looking out for. If it's all lumped in in, in one section, how are you going to spot those children and get that early intervention in? It, 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 yeah. It, yeah, absolutely. Mind, really. um, the, the EHCPs that I've put applications in for for children, we've used the, the month bandings because we've been able to accurately say, you know, this particular child is working significantly below the level that we would be expecting them to. And you can pull out the evidence from those strands showing that they were working at like 16 months or what have you, rather than 30 to 50. Now yeah, you yeah. can't really do that. K Karim, you've got a comment on this. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm thinking about that. We've already got a lot of issues with um, an SEND crisis in education. And I'm one, uh, listening to this, I'm wondering what kind of impact do you think it's going to be on yeah. getting children to, to get their CAMS assessments? Do you, do you worry that more children are going to fall through the gaps yeah. by following this? This is, it's worrying anyway, Cara. Um, one of the things that I'm fed up of being told working in early years is, oh, it's too young. They're too young to be able to put anything in place for them yet. No. Early intervention is key. And if we're flagging up an issue, it's not because we've decided to go, um, you, we think we'll pick on you. No, this, we're saying it for a reason. We've worked in this the sector long enough to know when mm. certain children need a little bit of additional support or we, we want to get something... Mm some support in place for that child and this is a barrier to that so so what what i'm getting from this is that you've got something that's that's really structured that's a kind of one size fits all for that and yet that doesn't then allow you to identify that minutiae of how children are progressing through the curriculum what support and development yeah. they might need um so, so moving on to the content of of thing i, I mean what, what how is this described as a curriculum how does it fit into what the school's doing what's its aim elaine what's the well, it talks about curriculum as a top level kind of um, sort of, you know, a top level plan 
um, a top level plan of everything that settings want children to learn. And the problem is, um, I mean, I, I will say it um, today, I will not be using this guidance in my setting with my children. I mean, this year, well, it's never going to be statutory. This guidance is not statutory guidance. So I right. think the sector, people need to realise that they haven't actually ever got to use it and that you can hold on to the, the you know, the guidance that America was talking about. That guidance is still out there. You might want to download it pretty quick and print it out before it gets mm -hmm. all hidden away. Um, but it's still out there and there's nothing, there's no one, Ofsted, no one can come and tell you that you must use this curriculum if you don't think it's fit for your, your practice. And it's, you know what, it's interesting because I've put it out there um, on social media and I've said to people, what do you think? You know, what's your thoughts? And people's views are that it's really quite a patronising document and it's written in quite a patronising way. Um, and this idea about the curriculum, the top level plan of everything that, you know, your setting wants children to learn. Well, this, this document is actually not giving me my top plan of curriculum, yeah. giving me a top plan by someone who, you know, a department that doesn't know my children, doesn't know my pedagogy. Yeah, doesn't... where's the, where's the, adapt where's the adaptability? Where can it link yeah. it to what your individual yeah. children need? Maybe. How can it support their, their individual development rather yeah. than just... Uh, and how, and how can yeah. it, you know, I mean, you know, we're a play-based um, setting, you know, I come from a nursery nursing background. I know about child development and I, I believe I know what children need. And this document isn't going to give my children what they need and it's not going to fit with my practice. So actually, yeah. that, you know, I will decide not to use it. Yeah. Uh, I totally agree. It's, it's formalising the, the early years in, and it ties in quite nicely from their point of view with the Bold Beginnings document that came out a little while ago. And right, which one was of the very things... controversial, wasn't it, amongst early years practitioners? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Go on. Not, not good. Um, one of the things that jumps out at me within this document is the observation checkpoints. Go on, tell are... me about observation checkpoints. I Sounds mean, military. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? And it could just be me being cynical. And those of you that know me, I am quite cynical. Never. Yeah, but with, with things such as baseline and stuff coming in, it just feels like an over-testing of children and putting in things like observation checkpoints. It, we're early years. We do observations ev all day, every day. It's what we do. I was going to say, surely that's an ongoing part of your role and those yeah. observations should be continuous, not Absolutely. individual. You're going back to that snapshot idea, aren't you? Here's a checkpoint, take a snapshot. But yeah. what about the child's ongoing development, which seems Absolutely. to be... Absolutely, so it, it just seems like they're, they're really wanting this focus on test the child at this point. So Call it what you will, whether it's an observation, this or the other, they're essentially saying, test them at this point, can they do this? So are there examples of We do of that this all the time anyway. Are there examples of this kind of formalisation in the, in, in the document itself? What's the content oh. look like? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Do, you want, do you want a good one? Con I think content is extremely concerning. Um, especially in the uh, reception band and some of, you know, some of the nursery band, real concerning move towards, and it is only my opinion, and um, I'm quite aware that when you raise these things, you get told that you're causing anxiety to the sector. Um, but as a reception teacher, the reception band to me is a move towards key stage one practice. Yeah. yeah. The FE, by their own admission, said that the yeah. whole point of all of these reforms was to kind of prepare children for Key Stage 1. Um, I'd agree with that. I mean, Lucy, yeah. like you, you know, I've, I've taught in Year 1, and quite a lot of the content, especially in things like, um, you know, learning about the world and sort of beginning to learn about, you know, people and places, quite a lot of that is actually Key Stage 1 curriculum, but it's now yeah. in the early years. Historical figures and places and using maps, yeah. and maps and copying. And that kind of um, adult sort of direction for, for learning and deciding what the children are going to learn rather than the children leading their own learning, which, mm. you know, practitioners 
want to be child-led, want to be led by the children, whereas this document is encouraging that top-down. And one of the ones that jumped out at me was some um, use of automatic recall of number bonds uh, to, to 10 for reception. And it's not that I disagree with children knowing their number bonds to 10, it's, it's that automatic recall that, um, that makes me sort of feel, what, why do they need to be drilled in, in that kind of thing? And then in three to four years, it says to recite numbers. Well, well, what uh, that word recite for a three-year-old, you, you know, what what does that mean? And I think Merica, you had one yeah you? in in the physical development section. Develop the foundations of a handwriting style which is fast, accurate, and efficient. And within the examples of how to support this section, it says teach and model correct letter formation. I mean, we we do that anyway, but it's not a a direct thing you wouldn't sit and do that over and over again with a reception child because it should be play-based however the next point down then says continuously check the process of children's handwriting pencil grip and letter formation including directionality provide extra help and guidance when needed plan for regular repetition so that correct letter formation becomes automatic efficient and fluent over time the children they're not robots I don't mm -hmm. And like you said, um, Elaine, you know, in, in your play-based setting, because last year I was reception and I was doing play-based, and, and you would do that, you teach those letter formations as part of their play. Yeah. So if they were right, you know, my children would make a model and I'd say, oh, let's write a story together. And you'd bring in some of that letter formation into that play-based storytelling, not as a let's all sit down with our whiteboards for half an hour and practice how to form the letter you know, um, it, it's it's what's relevant to those children and, and what they're going to get benefit from from that kind of learning. Yeah, I think there's an awful lot of the, the play based learning seems to be lacking um, from I think, the way this I is think, going. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the subject content is quite a concern, but I also think what really underpins the EYFS and Karen will um, appreciate this are these kind of like learning skills for life and sort of we call them the effective learning characteristics and what's happened although they're still there in name in the EYFS um, guidance um, statutory document and this guidance they've basically been completely downgraded and if you look in this new document at the ex and the examples that are given to show what these look like they're again very adult-led activity and also instead of actually sort of being about how children learn they've now been defined as sort of being linked to rates of development um so you've got all of you know so you've got something that really underpins you know so you've got the what and the how so this is the how of learning has completely been downgraded yeah. and when we were talking earlier on about what does a document look like the old document um had had um uh, diagrams in it to help you understand the planning process it had you know photos of real children you know from a range of um, you know backgrounds with a range of needs and actually what's missing from this document is children and yeah. what's missing from this document is it's not inclusive um, it doesn't address you know over co you know over this kind of lockdown yeah there's been covid but of course mm. But there's also been, I know you've done a lot of work in the NEU um, about, you know, the curriculum and how we can decolonise the curriculum. And there's not, you know, this, this, this guidance doesn't reflect, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't address anti-racism, it doesn't address inclusion and diversity. Um, and in terms of sort of um, anti-racism and diversity, you know, you might get a little short bullet point about, you know, well, make sure make sure children understand people are different or something like mm -hmm. that. That's not enough. It's got to be yeah. a that runs through the whole thing. So basically, it's as if the the philosophy that underlies this curriculum is just completely different from the direction we've been moving, and it's talking about instant recall of maths rather than um, building up those secure deep concepts you know when you talk about mathematical development you really need all of those concrete models to build a secure 
conceptual understanding. The recall comes later. It's about compression when you really have that full understanding. But, but also all of these elements that, that the whole of the education sector now seems to be shifting towards of developing proper anti-racist decolonized curriculum, just completely neglected in this guidance. Um, what also worries me and comes out in this is this focus on the formalization, rote learning, etc., moves us away from many of those kind of what are often termed softer skills, but that are so important for children's ongoing development. What what will be the impact of that in the secondary sector, Karen? Um, it's it's a very good question. Um, look, looking at the kind of soft skills that are required in secondary. Um, I've I've got quite a lot of concerns of this. I'd and I'd like to know what our guests think for it impacts will be. I mean, so so so. What do you think, guys? Is we're talking about basically moving away from children's social emotional development, away from a focus on their. Um, what will the impact be for them long term in terms of their education? My, I mean, my concern is that if um, the characteristics of effective learning get lost in translation with this document, then children aren't going to develop those skills of independence and inquiry and active learning and that real sort of desire to, to find out things for themselves, they're, they're constantly going to be waiting for an adult to tell them what to do next. Um, whereas as early years practitioners, we want children to be able to direct their own learning. And, and if we lose that, then when they get to later on in primary or in secondary, how are they going to be independent learners? Yeah, it's, it's a danger of a spoon fed education, isn't it? which I guess you see further up the secondary sector, those students who aren't able to organize themselves independently, et cetera. Um, just one, one other thing, uh, just we've been talking about the context. Does this not seem like the most ridiculous time to be launching a reform of the earliest mm -hmm. curriculum? I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not being funny, but there's a global pandemic. Really? Yeah, so, apparently so. Not in early years. <laughs> <laughs> not, not in primary in general, like, we still help um, What's the impact going to be on your workload as early years practitioners? Well, luckily, we're not early adopters, so we haven't yeah. got to do anything at the moment. But I'm aware that there are colleagues out there. I think it's about 2,800 schools, so not actually very many. And some are pulling out now that have signed up to be early adopters. So for those schools, they're going to have to be using this revised guidance. But what's interesting, and I think again adds to workload even more, is that this week it's been announced there's more guidance coming up to support this document. So they're releasing something else now to back this one up and sort of to help people use this one. Because so of all this spare time that you've got in this term, because this term's so uncomplicated, isn't it, in the early years? I mean, social distancing and so on. Simple in early years, right? Exactly. Yeah. You know, there are <laughs> colleagues out there right now who are going to be battling with all of this. And I, to tell you the truth, I don't know about the rest of you, but the week I've had, I mean, it's been a wonderful week. Oh, but I've had to think of things I've never thought of. How could I even be thinking about having mm. to use new guidance? Yes, yeah. new guidance, having to develop an entirely new way of traffic, traffic? tracking the progress that your children are making because the way that it's laid out is completely different. It's bonkers. On top of trying to deal with all the issues yeah. with the, the pandemic. And, and the yeah. guidance for early years in terms of the pandemic has been hideous anyway. So, so mm -hmm. practitioners in early years have already had to try and interpret the guidance, which wasn't helpful. Yeah. It, should have been, it should have been paused. All of this should have been paused. Yeah. You paused. know, baseline was paused unless you really want to do it. Um, which all, hopefully nobody does. Well, I feel sorry for if they have got to do that as well. But all of this, early adoption should have been paused. And, and what has been written and what has been put out should actually have been reviewed in light of the world that we're now living in. It's not the world it was when this was all written. Totally. Yeah. So one minute to go. Um, what, what's the solution? What should early years teachers, early years practitioners, those working in all early years settings, what, what should they be doing? Elaine, do you want to kick us off? Right, number one, stick with what you're using and stick with what you know. It's not going anywhere yet, so stick with that. Number two, get involved with the Early Years Coalition, 
Um, we are, we've challenged the government already over the EYFS reforms. And when people say, you know what, it's, it's okay being critical, but what's your solution? Well, we've got a solution. And our solution is across about, I think it's about 14 or 15 organisations. And with all of the sector involved, we are going to develop an alternative guidance, which is called Birth to Five Matters. And it's not going to be done behind closed doors. It's going to be developed with the sector, open, transparent process, you know, with diversity and inclusion at the heart and thinking about those really important anti-racist discussions we need to have. And it's going to be guidance by the sector and for the sector. Um, and we need everybody to get involved. We need to hear everyone's voice. Fantastic. OK, so everyone to get involved in that. Merica, Lucy, anything to add to that? Do what is best for the children in your care. You know them better than the people sitting in an office in London or wherever the other DfE officers are. You use your own professional judgment. You are the qualified member of staff, not them. Yeah, I agree with, with both of you. You know, don't, don't feel like you have to be complacent and just put your head down and get on with it. You know, be, be brave and join, you know, the thousands of early years educators who are standing up and saying, you know, we're, we're not going to take this. We're going to do what we know best. And Karim, I'm going to give the final word to uh, someone outside of the early years sector. Would you accept this in secondary if they were attempting to reform your entire curriculum at this time along lines that uh, the educators just didn't agree with? Or would you be going with the alternative? Well, well, considering how, how difficult it was in secondaries without a pandemic to get, go through all of the GCSE and A-level reforms, mm -hmm. um, that I have the re working through working through the new curriculum was so, so put such a high workload on us anyway. I, I really can't imagine what it must be like. You know, the prospect of doing this with a pandemic as well. It's 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 mind boggling to be honest. Right. So you heard it here. Early as educators get with the coalition, come together and put forward the alternative. Thanks very much to our special guests for joining us. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye.